Good morning, church. Good morning. Hope you're doing well. Hope you're doing well. It was supposed to be so hot, and it feels pretty good here. Are you all good? Get a fan out for a second, and we're still all right. We're still good? Good. Hey, uh, this, uh, this today marks uh, the last and sort of a series that I've been doing uh, about the book of Romans. So for those of you that have been here with us uh, the whole time, uh, you only have to see this slide or hear this part one more time. But in case you haven't been here, I want to get you caught up. The book of Romans uh, was written by Paul around uh, 57 AD. It's a book that was meant to unify uh, a part of the church that had been broken and split it up. Uh, they were divided, uh, and Paul writes sort of in four major divisions, and he sort of gives uh, a textbook of what does the Christian faith mean, what does it mean to worship this Jesus that we keep talking about. Uh, and if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know, but if you haven't, I'll, I'll catch up again. Uh, at certain points in the book, Paul has to drop like serious knowledge on these people. Paul has to look at them. You know, you have Jews bickering with Gentiles about traditions. You have uh, Gentiles who are like, well, we don't really have to do anything, right? We just, we just, we said, yay, Jesus, and now we're good, right? And, and Paul, at certain points, has to really hammer home uh, that both, you know, both uh, freedom from the laws uh, that had come up with the Jewish faith, but also this sort of responsibility that to be something different when we come to Christ. So that's sort of where, where Paul ha has been going. Uh, talking to one group of people who think that they are virtuous by, by the basis of their heritage, by basis of the rules that they follow, uh, and one group who believes truly uh, that they are virtuous only because Jesus was virtuous for them, uh, but they don't know how to then act upon that, what to do with that. So uh, one of the first things he did was say, you're all sinners. If you're here today and you don't know, you're not perfect. Congratulations, you're just like the rest of us. Uh, and that was one of the first things that you're not perfect. And then last week we talked about, okay, now that you know you're not perfect, now that you know that you're only saved by grace, remember that you're saved by grace and act like it. Uh, and that's sort of where we get into today. So this week we remember we're saved by grace, we're part of God's kingdom, but what does that look like going forward? And we're going to do things a little backwards. I don't know if you noticed when, uh, when I was reading, uh, we started in Romans 16, backtracked to Romans 12, and here's why. Uh, I saved uh, Nyla all the pain of reading one of those sections of the Bible that's just a list of unpronounceable names. You'll love this, by the way. Everyone, if you want to take a crack at some of those. Yeah. Feel better? Yeah. <laughs> um, this is a list of names that Paul writes at the end of his book of Romans. He tells uh, the readers, greet all of these people. And look at this, just a wonderful list of names. Phoebe, Priscilla, and Achaia, a Pentis, who was, I'm not even sure I'm saying his name right, uh, but he was a convert from Asia, uh, Mary, Andronicus, Junia, uh, Apelles, you can go all the way down the list, Narcissus, just a fun name, if you follow any like Greek mythology and things like that, uh, uh, Rufus and his mother, I love that, uh, Rufus, Rufus must have still been living at home or something, got a Greek mom too, uh, Hermes, Yulia, uh, just all these names, uh, Persis, who was a woman of the Lord, Trisphena and Tryphosa, who were uh, women of the Lord. Just an awesome list of names. And if you were reading your Bible, once again, if you want to open up, we're in Romans 16, personal greetings. Uh, Paul goes through this whole list, starting with Phoebe and working his way down. If you were reading through your Bible, if you were doing a Bible study week to week, this is one of those sections that you look at and go, list of names, and turn the page. I don't even need your list of names. Uh, but if you do that, you're sort of missing some beautiful things that are happening here. And you might not know this unless someone uh, would tell you this. I didn't know it until someone taught me this. There are, uh, depending on how you want to count the people who are sort of associated, like Rufus's mom, there are 27, 28, 29 names listed here. And what's awesome when you look at this list of names, there's a mix of Greek names and Jewish names. Some of these names were given to people of high status. Some of these names were given to people uh, of low status. Some of the names like the, the Append Appentus, he wouldn't have even been in the circle. He was like a complete outlier. He didn't, he didn't belong in this list of names. Uh, if you were pulling from the population of the area, he's from Asia. Some of these names started out as slaves. Some of them started out as free. 
What Paul has done here is, is listed the network of the church. And it's diverse. And it's different. And it includes people from all walks of life. In fact, Paul gets a rap a lot of times for being anti-women. But Paul's done a very impressive thing here. Phoebe, that first name on the list, he calls her a deacon. He gives her status within the early church, which would have been unheard of in its day. So you have men, you have women of the Lord, you have Jews and you have Gentiles, you have slaves and you have freed people, and you have people from, from uh, Rome and Greece, and you have people from uh, maybe more of the Jerusalem area, all around the Mediterranean, and people as far as Asia. These people mattered enough for Paul to name them, and they are a diverse group of people. And, and I want to tell you, this, this little section of the Bible that, that probably looks like, you know, it means nothing if you just turn to it. If you flipped your Bible open, and like I said, went to that, you'd be like, I'm going to pick a different section for today. But it gets me hot and excited because these are people 2,000 years ago who came from different backgrounds and different theologies and different traditions and different understandings of God and what that meant. Different understandings of what slavery meant and freedom meant. Different understandings about how much money uh, you need and what you, what you did with your money. And they have come together as one group of people. Paul says, you are the church. Go, do, be. As I said, we've debated for years and years uh, about uh, the role of women in church. But here's Phoebe, the deacon. The Jews and the Gentiles argue, how much law do you need in the church? How much tradition do you need in the church? Does it need to be all heritage and tradition? Or does it need to be none? You have people of diverse backgrounds, and they're together, worshiping. We shared last week that, that Rome, if, if you remember, Rome at this time has pretty much conquered the entire Mediterranean. So you have people who are, are citizens of the occupying forces of Rome. People who belong to the oppressive government who have come in and now they're part of the church next to people who feel persecuted or oppressed by Rome. The rich with the poor and, and, and diversity was meant to be the norm of the church. You were supposed to go to church with people that didn't agree with you about everything. You were supposed to go to church with people who had different experiences than you and come from different places than you. And it's my prayer that, that our church, we won't fall for the same issues and sometimes split this church that Paul's writing to. Paul calls a church together regardless of ethnicity, Jewish or Gentile status, slave or high profile member of the society, wealthy or poor, gender male or female, in culture and customs. Some of these people were split, actually Paul writes about this in a different section. Some of these people were simply split over should you eat meat or not? What a fight to pick in the church. But can you imagine a church split? Imagine we're planning for the potluck and, some, uh, a potluck and someone says, you can't have a hog roast. You can't have a hog roast. No, because we can't, we can't eat meat at church. And imagine that was a church split. That's what they were dealing with. They were splitting churches over whether or not you should be a vegetarian or not. And we might say, oh, that sounds like something from the past. But we know, we know living in the world today that sometimes it is hard for us to get our act together as the church because we come from very different backgrounds. The easy one is always the political one. We have a hard time because some are Republicans and some are Democrats. And the other side's evil. It doesn't matter which side's the other side. The other side's evil, right? And that's the way we treat people sometimes. So you get into church and have political conversations, split a church. Those are the easy ones. But what about hymns? We're doing a lot of hymns today. What about hymns versus contemporary? How many churches have split over hymns versus contemporary? How many churches have split over not only hymns and contemporary, which hymn? How many churches have split? How many churches have split over, this is a genuine one, didn't happen to me, pastor uh, that I served with for a long time, shared this one. Church split over the color of the carpet. We need a red carpet in the sanctuary. No, we need a blue carpet in the sanctuary. Well, you guys don't have your red carpet in a different church. Church split. Because these issues that divide us speak to a different setting of our heart, where we divide ourselves from one another 
If you don't think like me, we can't serve together. We have whole denominations that are built on this idea that we can't agree what it means to worship Christ. But what is Paul telling us? What is Paul telling us? He's telling us, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions or put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching of what you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. Take note of that one. That's a big one. Often in the church, we're trying to serve our own appetites. I'll say that's, that's true from the bottom to the top. I like doing church this way, or I think this, and that's the way we want to do it. Of course it is. By smooth talk or flattery, they deceive the minds of the naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent and about what is evil. Paul is saying, brothers and sisters, don't let your relationships with people, don't let your relationships with people distract you from your purpose. And that one I want to say right now, that's a good one. Don't let your relationships with people distract you from your purpose. Just because someone does not think like you or act like you or, or believe perfectly the same things as you does not mean that you are not called together as the church because the church has one distinction. Are you a sinner saved by the grace of Jesus Christ? Do you know the love of God through Jesus? If so, you're part of the club now. You're in. And anything else Anything else that divides you, makes you different, we got to fight against those things because those are the things that get away from the church doing what it needs to do. Those are the things that ensnare us and trap us. In fact, Paul uses two big words uh, in verses six, 15 and 16. One's using 15, one's using 16, and I love these words. You're going to learn a little, a little Greek today. Uh, the first word is ecclesia, ecclesia, which is actually the word, uh, it's the root for how we got to church, if you follow the language cues. Uh, ecclesia is the church. So ecclesia means the assembly, those who have been called out. Literally, it means to, to call out of a population. So if I started picking names out here and pulled you out, that is the official definition of the ecclesia, those who have been called out. And then the church also is supposed to share koinonia, which is just a fun word. You should all say it. Give it a try. Koinonia. I love it. Which means sharing fellowship, intimate connection, and relationship. When we ask for prayer requests, joys, and concerns, and someone looks in this room, as we had several people today, and say, I have a family member, and they have cancer, and that hurts, and we're struggling. You're sharing koinonia. When you sit at a table with someone and you know we don't have a lot in common, but boy, you know what? We both worship Christ. So passion with the potatoes, we're going to sit and share a meal together. You're sharing quite a bit. In fact, there's an intimacy connected to this word that the church is called to share. And many of us, especially where, you know, we're, we're rural sort of country, uh, most of us in some ways, sharing intimacy with one another. No, we don't do that. We keep to ourselves. We're very private. Guys, I'm going to call you out, especially the guys. Yes, we, we, we don't talk about such things. We, we just power through and things like that. There's an intimacy that is supposed to exist within the church that you share with one another. Because here's the reality. I talked about all those things. Hymns versus contemporary, Republicans versus Democrats, green carpet, blue carpet, red carpet, whatever carpet you like. When someone is struggling with cancer, when someone's lost a loved one, those things don't matter anymore. So why do we let them matter in between? When someone's celebrating the birth of a new baby, do you care what political party they belong to? Do you care whether or not uh, they think we should have a council-driven church or an elder board church or whatever it is that divides up these denominations? No. In those moments, what are we focused on? We're focused on community. The called out who share intimate fellowship with each other and connection. This is the church. And you belong to this if you call on Christ. It doesn't matter if you were rich or poor before you got here. It doesn't matter if you are male or female, if your heritage is different, if your ethnicity is different. It doesn't matter where you came from. Here Paul is telling Greeks, Greeks and, 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 and Jews and Gentiles, he's telling them, these people from Africa and Asia who have been worshiping these gods that are, are completely different than anything we're talking about, they're allowed in too. 
Paul is telling us in verse or chapter 16 to greet every one of these people. In fact, he goes in front of you. Talk about intimacy. Greet them with a holy kiss. He says, "There's an intimacy implied here. Greet them with love and care. You are the ecclesia shared together in koinonia. You are unified in your one anotherness. You are supposed to be together. This is what Paul is calling for the church." that has been divided about rules and regulations and what it means to follow Christ. They've been at each other's throats, and what does Paul tell them? Greet each other with a holy kiss. Be intimate in love and care for each other. Step outside of your comfort zones and sit at the table with someone who you don't agree with. Share everything with them. Share the good and share the bad, regardless of our biases. Because Paul knew but the most powerful thing that can happen to the church is to not just be a group of people who sort of know each other, but brothers and sisters in Christ moving forward for God's kingdom. In fact, he keeps using this. I urge you, brothers and sisters. I urge you, brothers and sisters. He uses it again when we step back to chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. Oh, Boston, that's a, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be transformed. Be different. In fact, be a living sacrifice. To be a sacrifice of love for someone means stepping out of your bubble. It takes sacrifice to see someone you disagree with and, and love on them anyway. In fact, some of us sit in a room and maybe feel like we disagree with somebody on everything. How much humility does it take to still love that person? How much humility and sacrifice does it take to say, my way is not the only way and my journey is not the only journey. Therefore, my true and proper act of worship, my true and proper act of worship is to love regardless of these things. That's why today's sermon is entitled Love in Action. Because when we submit to this love, we find ourselves caring for those we wouldn't even connect with. We find ourselves working with those that we might not have ever considered. So here this church, this is another great section. Uh, I'm going to read just pieces of it, but this is from uh, Romans uh, 12 a little further. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. This is the mission that he has given for the church in community. Love one another. And don't love one another because you read a book that said you're supposed to love one another. Don't love one another because the pastor said we have to love one another, so I'm going to pretend I love you because that's what I'm supposed to do. No, love must be sincere. Cling to what is good and be devoted to one another. Honor somebody else. What does it look like to honor somebody else? To be patient and joyful with them. To share with them when they're in need. To practice hospitality. In fact, you're, uh, the, the verses go on. If you're following, this comes from 12. I'm at, I'm at verse 14 now. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them and do not curse. If they don't agree with you, bless them even more. If they're mean to you, try to bless them a little harder even. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of a lowly position. Don't be conceited. Don't pay evil with more evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's a big one. We can circle that. You got your Bible. That's a pencil marker right there. If it's possible for you, your end, live at peace with everyone. You can't control somebody else and what they do, but for your end, live at peace with everyone. That is the call of the church. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends. Leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Let God figure it out. Your job is to love everyone. 
If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you keep burning coals on his head. Paul even goes as far as to say, kill him with kindness. Because if they really hate you, when you act nice, they'll think something's wrong with you. And then they'll start asking what's wrong with you and be like, I just believe Jesus wants me to be nice to you. And that'll mess them up. <laughs> love must be sincere. Don't just get along to go along, but truly love all people. And yes, A-L-L, all people. This is such a hard one. I, I hesitated to even make commentary on this because Paul has laid out such wonderful instructions for us. But it's just what we were talking about. What is our role in the church? What is our role in our community when we find people who don't even agree with us on faith issues? We honor them. We love them. We live at peace with them. We show Christ through the way that we treat them. We celebrate with them. We cry with them. We bless them. Especially those who are of a lower position. If God has blessed you with a higher position, that doesn't mean that you have to like, you know, walk around flailing yourself. Oh, woe is me. I have a lot of good stuff. No. But it also means you should be the first in line to help someone who's in need. Be kind and loving. Because it might even drive the people out in the world who aren't kind and loving to ask what is so different about you and this group of people. This is the church, and this is the best way I can phrase it. Don't go to church. You're all here in church today. Keep doing that. But don't just go to church. Go out and be the church. When people meet you in the streets, they should know that something is different about you. When they read what you post on Facebook, they should see that you are a loving and kind person. This is our designation and our distinction. We are supposed to look different to the world. We are transformed by what God has done in our lives. We shouldn't look like everybody else. And we shouldn't get along like everybody else. Because in the rest of the world, people are dividing themselves more and more. Oh, you have to agree with me on everything. Oh, you have to agree with me on everything. How many family tables at Thanksgiving and Fourth of July or whatever continue to divide? How many people continue to look for ways that they're less like everyone else? But instead, what are we looking for? We're looking for ways to bring more people to our table, celebrate together. And we are going to be a church that blesses and finds peace together. This is my church experience. It's our church experience. This is home. My challenge to you as you go into the world this week is to be the church. And, and whether that's this physical building or some other physical building, we are Christians called by Christ's love. And we should be looking out into the world and saying to everyone, this can be your home too. Receive that message today. This is your home too. I don't care what your favorite sports team is. I don't care what your politics are. I don't care if you're rich or poor. I don't care if you're married or divorced or single forever. I don't care what any of that is. None of that will divide us. I don't care if you've never stepped foot in a church before. I don't care if you know every song in the hymnal. Everyone has a place here because here we are transformed. Not by what we do, but by what we have received from God. And when we work together for God's kingdom, we can do powerful, powerful things. I won't get into the theology of this conversation, but, but there's an old saying that goes around, especially in the evangelical church. The devil stopped trying to turn people evil a long time ago. He just found minor things to distract them from what they're supposed to be doing. So the devil's not whispering in your ear about all this evil that you can do in the world. Instead, he just wants to distract you. Let's get you more caught up in building maintenance. Let's get you more caught up in politics. Let's get you more caught up in keeping up with the Joneses so that you're not out loving your neighbor. Let's not be those people. Instead, let's be people who focus on the prize and the prize is the love of Jesus Christ made manifest on a cross so that we can receive forgiveness of sins and know everlasting life in God the Father. Church, when we do that, lives are changed. Go into your community this week and be the church. Amen. Let us pray. God of love, we pray today that we will be kingdom people. That we will not be distracted by, by things that separate us. Whether that's in our own church groups, whether that's in, in cliques that we have, whether that's in our friendships and our social groups, our family, all the way out to our community, Lord. Let this church, let all churches, but especially let us here to hear this word today, know what it means to go out in the world and knock down the things that divide us. And instead say in one voice, we are Christians. And like we're going to sing in a moment, how do they know us? They know us by love. 
and peace. Let us be people who bring more love and peace into the world. Not more hate, not more anger, not more division. We are people of peace and love. And sometimes that is so hard, Lord. But we pray this day that we will let down all these things that keep us from interacting and caring for one another. And instead, share koinonia, share intimacy and love as a church. Share community together as your people who you have called out to do your work this day. Amen.